In the previous lecture on economic sociology, we were talking about wage gaps and different kinds of wage gaps, like the racial wage gap and the gender wage gap. And um, the first explanation that we gave, we outlined three kinds of wage gaps, human capital theory or, or skills as, uh, as part of the wage gap. The second is discrimination and the third is selection. Human capital was the idea that people just have different skills and that explains their different wages. In this lecture, we're going to continue this discussion, thinking about discrimination um, uh, and also about selection. So a commonly held theory is that wage gaps emerge because employers or customers discriminate against certain kinds of workers. So um, an example of this would be like, you know, the example on, on the screen is like, if I hate people who like basketball, I may never hire people who, who uh, like basketball because I don't want to work for them. And that lowers their wages because they like, there's one place that they can't get a job. And if they can't get a job at that place, um, they're less competitive at other jobs because at other jobs, their threat to exit isn't as high. Um, and, you know, We'd be interested less in like this relative to basketball and more relative to something like race. So, are there examples of discrimination by um, race? In a classic economic position, race, racial discrimination should not be sustainable within labor markets. What that means is that, like, if I'm an employer and I choose to discriminate against certain kinds of workers, like, for example, black workers that should come at cost to me. That should actually be expensive for me. Why? Well, because there'll be some other employer out there who doesn't discriminate and can hire those black wage workers at lower wages and outcompete me. Because my preference for only having white workers is gonna cost me more money. And so economists, at least in theory initially, think of discrimination as not being sustainable within labor markets. And while that might be a solid theory, I would note that it's not, there's considerable empirical evidence of discrimination as happening within labor markets. This is both historical evidence and, as I said, experimental evidence, like audit studies that show that people have a taste for certain kinds of workers. In the very first lecture that I gave in this series of lectures, I talked about Diva Pager's work and her work about the impact of a criminal record in, exper in her experimental design, um, looking at why it was that labor market discrimination may be sustainable, discrimination both against racial and ethnic minorities and against people with a criminal record. And to remind you what that study did was in part, and I'll only talk about one part of the study, um, send the same group of people out to apply for a job, that is people with exactly the same qualifications and some were white and some were black, and it found that the callback rate for the white employers was far higher. In other words, people called white applicants back to potentially hire them for the job at way higher rates than they did black applicants. And so this suggests that there is some evidence and non-trivial evidence for labor market discrimination as part of producing racial wage gaps. A third factor is self-selection. So when people talk about the gender wage gap in particular, they often talk about discrimination, but a different factor and one that provides some explanation for gender wage gaps is self-selection. So this idea is sometimes referred to as occupational sorting. And occupational sorting is that people get sorted into different kinds of occupations which have different kinds of wages, and that men and women may have preferences for different kinds of occupations, and that having preferences for those different kinds of occupations produces some of the wage gaps. So the gendered wage gap isn't just a product of discrimination, or maybe it's not a product of discrimination at all. Instead, it's a product of self-selection. So, let me give a couple examples of this and sort of outline what the, what the theory here is. The theory is that women are usually responsible for child care, and many researchers believe this is an important factor in the wage gap. So women are picking jobs that they feel that they can balance with their child care duty. 
and that these jobs are likely to be lower paid or part time. So if women have responsibility for child care, one of the things that may happen to them is that they have to pick jobs or that they, because of have to may be a strong, but they, yeah, I would say have to pick jobs uh, because of those responsibilities, which limit some of their opportunities. So um, what, do, what do we know about childcare? Well, kids get sick. When kids get sick, somebody's got to take care of them. They, don't have, they are not able to go to school. And so who's going to take care of them? It's more likely to be the mother than the father. And that may lead mothers to pick jobs that they can take time off from more easily. But jobs that you can take time off from more easily might pay less. Kids also have long holiday breaks. There's summer holidays and other holidays throughout the year. And that those holidays are typically longer than parents have the capacity to take time off from work. And so mothers, if they're responsible for childcare, may be more likely to take part-time jobs that they can quit, say, during the summer when it's time for them to take care of children who are no longer in school. Now, it's curious to call this self-selection, but it kind of, you know, because like in some ways it's like, well, it's clearly a consequence of the organization of society where women are being asked to do more childcare than men. And so this is producing this labor market outcome. But at the same time, we, we, can see, we do see evidence of women selecting into different kinds of jobs. You know, another example of this would be lawyers. Um, you know, the highest paid lawyers work at, um, especially early on, very intense, demanding law firms that like maybe sometimes you have to work 60, 70, 80 hours in a week. And some women may choose not to work in those kinds of firms because they find that like it doesn't allow them to do the other kinds of things that they want to do in their lives. And so they are selecting out of the highest paying jobs. Selection into occupation or occupational sorting then can explain some of the gender wage gap. In summary, I would say that all of these things provide some explanation. The differences in human capital are important for explaining wages. Um, the, uh, occupational sorting is important for explaining wages, and the discrimination is important for explaining wages. And then all three need to be considered. Um, I would also note that occupational sorting or self-selection into occupation can be thought of as a form of discrimination because different groups of people have different incentives to pick different kinds of jobs based upon non-labor market conditions. Or, like, it's not necessarily the case <coughs> that women have to do all of the child care, right? That is a choice that social, that societies make, and that the consequence of that choice leads to women having lower wages because they're doing that kind of work. And we should think critically about that and think, like, are there social policies that could help alleviate some Okay, with that in mind, we might pivot our analysis away from individuals in the labor market and how individuals are navigating the labor market and what their wages are to institutions within um, uh, the broader economy. And this means thinking about corporations and corporations as social institutions. Social life is basically a kind of team sport and corporations are teams for the profit world in the for-profit world. You can think about the kinds of corporations that you know. Have you ever worked in one? You know, if you've worked in um, uh, retail, you've probably worked for a corporation before. What responsibilities, you might ask, do corporations have to you as a worker and to other people and to other corporations? Corporation is a legal entity where people come together to form a business, a business that in some ways insulates the individual members from the risks of what the collective does. So corporations um, are, some form of them are called limited liability corporations, an LLC, 
And what an LLC does is it insulates individuals from the risk of what the collective body has done. Corporation comes from the Latin word body, corpus, and it's a collection of people together to form some kind of business. If you ever visit New England in the United States, you'll see sometimes towns will say they were founded in, say, 1645. Others will say they were incorporated in 1645, which means it's a collective entity that's formed by a group of people, typically the business purpose. Not always, but in particular today, classically with a kind of business purpose. And that as such, these are social institutions. These are institutions that are produced that, that have a kind of social dynamic within them. Now, as sociologists understand corporations, they think about them relative to a bureaucratic and hierarchical form. So the real hallmark of a corporation is a top-down structure. And looking at corporations as having what's sometimes referred to as like an org chart or how it, an organization of that corporation. And so, you know, I want to zoom in here for some of you um, just to kind of look at this to see what it is that, that, that this is showing us. But, you know, at the top of the corporation are the stockholders. And then there might be a board of directors, a president, a treasurer, or vice presidents, a general superintendent. And then, you know, down there's like a finance department. There are holding companies. There are construction pieces. This is like Kind of the understanding of a corporation as having an overall structure to it. And so they have a set of rules about how it is that the corporation is organized. And people typically have specialized skills and know how to work the, those sets of skills. And they know in general who is above them and where they are in a chain of command. <clears throat> And the corporate structures make large-scale economic po uh, production possible. So um, the study of economic sociology is sometimes the study of organizations and of their structural dynamics, their hierarchical or bureaucratic structural dynamics. Now, in our modern language, we sometimes think about um, uh, uh, corporate structures uh, and bureaucracies in negative terms. But I want you, at least in, in this context and in the context as um, uh, 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 analysis of corporate life, to understand that bureaucracy is not necessarily a negative term. And in fact, it can mean something very, very positive. The advantages of bureaucracies is that there are clear rules to the organization and that people have to follow those rules. The critical feature of a bureaucracy is that individuals don't matter within a bureaucracy. What an individual is doing is not particularly important within a bureaucracy. Instead, what individuals do is they hold an office or a position and then they follow the sets of rules that are expected of that position. This can produce high degrees of efficiency, really high degrees of efficiency, because everyone in this organizational chart before you kind of knows their place and knows what's expected of them and knows what's expected of the people above them and what's expected of, if they are supervising people, what's expected of the people below them. And so the expectations for how you act are not personal or even idiosyncratic, they are instead specific and defined not by the person who occupies the position, but by the position itself. This makes navigating the organization much easier, much, much easier, because in order to like get through the organization, in order to move your way through it, you don't have to know what the president of the organization is like. You just need to know what the job is. You just need to know what the set of rules are. So the advertising department of this corporation has a set of expectations of it. And it has a set of rules that it's supposed to follow. It has a set of functions that it's supposed to provide. And it doesn't really matter who runs the advertising department. 
What matters is that they follow those sets of rules or expectations. And so corporate bureaucracies are critically important because they make actions and performances predictable. And the predictability of those actions means that people can actually pursue goals in a highly rational way because they know how the thing is organized and they know how the people above them are likely to act. So you may hear people in kind of everyday lives talk about Ugh, a bureaucracy and how terrible a bureaucracy is. But from the perspective of an economic sociologist and even an economist, bureaucratic structures can be highly, highly efficient because they make things much more predictable. And predictability is great for people because it allows them to reason their way through the different sets of conditions that they're in. Corporations, their general goal is to generate profits. And corporations are influenced by the rest of the society. They're not totally removed from everything. Governments regulate them. There are regulations about monopolies. There are regulations about labor laws. They can't make people work super long times. There are regulations about of distribution, and, and there are regulations relative to taxes and their overall structure. There are regulations about discrimination. They also give money to charities and are engaged in public-facing charity events. And these charity functions that corporations uh, 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 participate in are usually part of their overall obsession with their public image. So, you know, you can think about corporations as untouchable behemoths, but unlike other social organizations, or, or me, like other social organizations, they're intimately entwined with the larger society. And so you could ask yourself, like, what are the checks and balances on corporations? Um, and what are the sets of things that kind of could limit them? You know, activists will criticize shoe manufacturers, for example, for paying incredibly low wages in industrializing countries. So Nike is actually often the subject of this kind of criticism. And, you know, the, as a consequence, corporations have adopted a range of things, sometimes marketing tools, but sometimes real practices where they say, we're not involved in sweatshop laborers, we don't use child labor, et cetera, in order to make sure that uh, the workers are treated better. This helps us see how corporations' profit motives exist in dialogue with social expectations about what is right and good. And that, you know, it would be highly profitable for corporations to just use sweatshop labor, to use child labor and other things like that, except that it becomes not profitable for them if there is a social backlash to the, the ways in which they're seen as doing all kinds of harms. And, you know, this helps reveal something very interesting and a kind of tension in how people think about corporations. We want them to behave well, corporations to behave well and satisfy our expectations for good behaviors, but corporations' purpose is not to do good, it's usually to make money. And so aside from obeying the law, their main goal is to earn profits for their shareholders. The question becomes, how do you reconcile this? How do we reconcile the aim or the pressure that's put on a lot of corporate bodies in order to act better with the fact that the main purpose of a corporation is a profit. Um, you know, uh, uh, the main business purpose of a business is to generate profits and to make people happy. And why should we expect them to do anything else? Well, part of the answer here is based in the idea that, you know, sometimes making profits is conditional on not angering companies. This leads to the rise, this sort of pressure of the dual purpose of making people happy and making money and how those might be related to the rise of ethical consumerism in contemporary society. And ethical consumerism is partially the idea that, um, that through our consumption practices, through my consumption practices, and through your consumption practices, we could be more or less ethical. So we could either support companies that treat workers well, or we could not. And so, you know, we could ask like, do you support companies that meet some ethical standards for you? 
would you buy something from somebody that uses child labor if it was you know, reasonable enough for you? Do you believe in something like fair trade or green businesses, like um, or fair trade meaning you don't pay people what you can afford to pay them, you pay them what is a reasonable wage for their work. So yes, coffee growers could be paid less money because there's a lot of coffee out there in the world, but we want to pay a fair wage to workers. And so we're going to pay them more because we think that that is um, important. Across the country in the United States right now um, is, uh, are a series of fair wage ordinances. And fair wage ordinances are ordinances that say, like, you know, we gotta pay people a living wage, a wage that actually supports them in doing the series of things that they um, are trying to do to maintain themselves as individuals in a society. All of this points to the economy as being deeply embedded in social life. And one of the major take homes that I want you to have from this point of the lecture is just how embedded economies are. They are not autonomous things, free of social processes, but instead they're embedded from all, in all kinds of non-economic dimensions of social life. And that instead of thinking about the economy as abstracted, from all of these other things, we should think about it as embedded, as enmeshed within lots of other dimensions of our social life.